Believe me, it's more interesting than it looks. Hey guys, my name is Liam and this is Jeep Sheep TV. I'm so excited to announce that this is the first video in the series of teaching you exactly how to supercharge your four cylinder Jeep. Now, if you don't own a four cylinder Jeep, I'd be really curious as to how you found the video, honestly. But this video I'm hoping is entertaining and insightful for you as well. Maybe you're supercharging something else or you're just considering it and this might lead you down a path of inspiration. That's how these things work. In order to get to this point, I had to go on a lot of forums of Miatas and Mini Coopers and vehicles that have four cylinders often, whereas the Jeeps are heavily dominated by the six cylinder world. So it's okay to branch out. And if you're not a Jeep person, I'm really glad you're here and you should buy a Jeep. Before we get started with the actual installation, I would like to tell you a couple fun facts about the M62 supercharger that I chose for this build. I talked in the last video about some of the reasons why I chose it. And then I did some research and found out that it was a pretty good choice. So this is a lot of information is coming off of uh, Victory Tech Papers or victorysomething.com. I will post a link in the description. From what I can gather, I believe they are writing this whole tech article on things you can do to supercharge a motorcycle. So, I don't know, that's awesome. Thanks guys, and carry on, that's super cool. But the Eaton M62 supercharger is a phenomenal little supercharger. It has a displacement of roughly one liter per revolution. Now, if you have a 2.5 liter engine like I do, you're going to be producing about 1.25 liters per revolution of engine displacement, and that's, Pretty exciting because the supercharger is going to be displacing an entire liter. So you're increasing your displacement or the amount of air in that cylinder by quite a bit. It can sustain an RPM of 14,000 revolutions per minute, which is a lot. Meaning you can put a small pulley on this thing and spin the crap out of it and it'll be just fine. It can be mounted in any orientation. Now that's really great because in our application, we're going to be mounting it relatively flat, but that's not always the case. And so it's good to know that we can mount it however we want. This one's interesting to me. It's supposed to be dry. So the rotors have a coating on them and the coating is important for it to maintain its function. Meaning you shouldn't be spraying gasoline on the Eaton superchargers because it can eat away the coating. Well, before, we talked about the Boosted Technology Supercharger, which is a heavily modified Eaton Supercharger. The guts are an Eaton Supercharger. And so I'm curious as to how they managed spraying gasoline into the supercharger when you're not supposed to be doing that. So that's very curious to me. They have a long service life. The Eaton Superchargers, they don't actually contact. The rotors don't touch each other. And so they're just passing by each other, pushing air and doing their job and not creating a lot of wear. The ends of the supercharger are oil-filled gearboxes, kind of, and they have a long service life. They're known for long service periods, which is really great for something that we're doing, which is an off-road build, where stuff that lasts a long time is pretty important because we're gonna beat the crap out of it. <laughs> Woo! Another thing that I found very interesting is that with the Eaton superchargers, they're intended generally to have the throttle body before the supercharger, which is not what we did in this case. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that in the future episodes, but it's something to take note of. Most of the time, when you see this in an OEM build, they have the throttle body before the supercharger and the Mercedes that we took this off of did not. So there's a little bit we can talk about later. And some people might say, oh, you need the M90. The M90 is bigger for, for a bigger engine. And yeah, that's true. The M90 is for a bigger engine. 
The N62 is actually designed for a 2.5 liter to a 4 liter engine displacement size, meaning that we are right at the bottom end of what it's capable of, which is great because that means that we can play around with it and really get a lot of boost out of this if we wanted to. Speaking of boost, apparently the Eaton superchargers don't create pressure. They don't pressurize air. They just push it and they just happen to push it into piping where it gets pressurized. I don't know why that was an important distinction, but it was one that I read. And for those of you nerding out on this, now you know. Also, the last bit of interesting information about the Eaton M62, and this has a practical application, is this list right here. The Eaton M62 supercharger is found in this list of vehicles right here. However, and this is important for what we're going to talk about, not all of them are the same shape. So I'm gonna read through the list real quick because it is quite fascinating, all the different vehicles throughout time that have had this supercharger. One being the 91 through 95 Buick Park Avenue Ultra. Didn't know that, super cool, now I wanna buy one. Also the Buick Riviera, the Cobalt SS, and now we're into the Mercedes, the C230, that's the supercharger that we're using here, as well as the SLK230, same supercharger. Also, Nissan Frontier and Xterra from 98 to 02 had the Eaton M62, as well as Oldsmobile 88 LSS and 98, and the Pontiac Bonneville all had the Eaton M62 from 91 to 95. I mentioned that they're different sizes, for example, the Cobalt I know is a very long supercharger. It's got a long nose and it's got a long end at the back. Now that's the perfect segue into what we're talking about next. This is an illustration of your engine. This is the 2.5 liter four cylinder designed by AMC and put in Jeeps for quite a long time. This engine is not very long in comparison to its brother, the 4.0 six cylinder. And as a result, supercharger sourcing can be kind of difficult because you need a supercharger here. This is your front of your engine and the pulley would be living somewhere in here where the AC compressor would normally live. And a lot of the superchargers, especially the ones found on the GM cars, have a long nose on them, which would put it way back here and it's gonna start running into stuff or even into the firewall if the supercharger is long enough. What's nice about the Mercedes supercharger used on the SLK 230 or the C230 is it's quite stubby. It's very short and it's designed for a four cylinder and it's designed to be put on the side of a four cylinder just below roughly where the alternator would be on our engine. So there's a lot of advantages from the OEM design. What we're going to talk about is how you can prepare to install that supercharger. What you're going to end up doing is you're gonna end up building a bracket, which looks something like this. It's going to be a rectangular in nature bracket. That's gonna live right here, right on top of the air conditioning compressor mount. And you can see right off the bat that the dipstick is starting to get in the way. So you're going to actually take the dipstick and you are going to bend it down. Now I did this, I took the whole thing off and I put it on a bench and I, I bent it real careful just to come to realize I could have bent it in place. This has a bracket which attaches it to the engine block roughly where you want to bend it. So it's gonna be fixed in place and you're gonna to wanna to bend it there. Just don't kink it because that sucks. The dipstick is then going to live right underneath of the bracket and that's okay. I relocated mine and I was able to get it in and out without any real issue. You just need to now reach under a bracket versus in the open air. It's just a little bit more of an inconvenience and it's not that bad. The other thing that you're going to need to note is you're gonna get really close to these lines here. These are your heater hose lines, but you're not gonna to touch them and that's okay. And you are gonna be blocking off cylinder one spark plug. So you're gonna to have to remove the supercharger in order to get to cylinder one. And we can talk about in just a moment ways to make the supercharger removal very quick and easy if you find yourself servicing spark plugs quite often. The next thing you need to know is right here. This is your coolant hose and it's actually going to come forward in vehicle eventually and go to your radiator. The coolant hose gets incredibly close to the supercharger, incredibly close. And so you're going to want to trim it down. It makes a sharp 90 degree turn 
right up here. And actually, I drew this poorly. It's going to be like that. It turns right away. And if you, the more you can shorten it, the better you're going to be because it is going to touch the supercharger. And you want to minimize that contact as much as possible. Now, before we dive too much into the mounting of the supercharger and the actual physical mount that you'll be making, we're gonna talk about the belts because setting up the belt is incredibly important. The belt runs the supercharger and doing it the right way early on will set you up for success. So what I've drawn here is the four different belt combinations that I'm aware of, there might be more. And this is the serpentine belt. So if we're talking about the early four cylinders, the Comanche had this, the early YJs had this, possibly the Cherokee, I don't know. They had V belts. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just the ones with the serpentine belt as it's the same serpentine belt used by the Mercedes supercharger from the factory so we don't have to change pulleys. What I'm aware of is a no AC or no air conditioning scenario or a with air conditioning scenario. And I'm also aware of two different categories which I'm classifying as the YJ or the square headlight wrangler from 89 to 95 or 87, depending on who you talk to. Why, why is that a thing? Anyway, or the TJ, which would be 96 to 2007 or 97 to 2007. I'm messing these up today. You can grill me in the comments and make it just a fun little, little conversation for everyone. You, you gotta have something, right? The Jeep Cherokee also had the four cylinder and i believe if i remember correctly it had the yj setup maybe they changed somewhere in that time period but you're gonna have one of these or something very similar and like i said if there's something else let me know so this is your crank i'm just gonna do cr for crank this is water pump wp this is power steering ps this is idler so we're gonna do id and this is alternator, we'll do AL for alternator. It's important to note that on the YJ setup, the power steering pump is used as your tensioner. So this can actually rotate kind of like this, maybe it's a little bit more horizontal, and it's going to expand that belt and tension it. All right, the belt's getting more loose, so you know you're going the right direction. Take note that this belt routing is going to be different in the newer model year, and we'll talk about that. And there's very subtle changes that make that so. Now, when they put the air conditioning on the YJs or on the Cherokees or just about anything from this time period, I don't know, they added an idler pulley. And the reason being that if you were to add a pulley right here, and you bring this belt up and come down, your contact patch on the alternator is quite small. That's the same issue we're gonna run into with the supercharger if you didn't previously have air conditioning. How they remedied that is they added another idler. If we come back over here, you'll see right here, there is a bolt that is larger than all of the other bolts on the timing chain cover. And so you've got a bolt here and a nut on the rear. And so what you're gonna want to do is apply a wrench to the rear. Ooh, beautiful. If you don't have an idler there, you probably confuse as to why it's there. If you do have an idler there, then you know that there's an idler pulley that belongs there. I'll try and post a link below if I can find an idler pulley that you can buy. Otherwise, junkyards are really good for this. And you have an idler pulley right here from the factory. I believe it's the same one. So you could get an additional one and you can put it down here. Once you've got the idler pulley, you're really, you're pretty much done to be able to install your supercharger because that would be, this is normally the air conditioning right here. That's where your supercharger would go. And just for the folks at home, crank pulley, water pump, power steering, alternator, idler, other idler, and then this we're gonna change from AC to supercharger SC. So there you go. Now, that's not what I did. What I did was something way more difficult, but also rewarding, and we'll talk about that now. The TJ did this differently. 
So again, power steering, crank, water pump, idler, and alternator. If you don't drive a TJ, this might be foreign to you. There's another idler here and that idler is the tensioner and it moves this way. What's convenient about that is it's on a threaded rod which comes up here and it's right at the top of the engine. You can throw a socket and a drill on there and you can tension and loosen your belt in like three seconds versus fighting with this one and getting your hand stuck in the fender well. It's way, way, way better as far as tensioning goes. But you need to replace your intake manifold. You need to replace your power steering pump. You need to replace the bracket holding the power steering pump. And there's some weird thing where that bracket attaches to the block right at the engine mount that I still haven't fully figured out, but we're just running with it. It's a buttload of work to switch over to this and I have a video about it. Put it in the comments if you want to convert your YJ or older style into the newer style belt routing, let me know. I can post the video, but I'm gonna warn you, it's a buttload of work. And so I, I, that's why I didn't post it. What you'll notice is the belt routing is different. And this is important because now, as after the belt goes around the alternator, instead of going straight down to the crank pulley, it goes back up to the water pump pulley. And so if we were to throw another pulley here, it'll come up, come back down, and it still has a large contact patch down on the bottom here to run the alternator and we don't need to add another idler. And that's shown here, by the way, this is the TJ with the air conditioning and you can see the routing there, where this would be your supercharger. If I remember correctly, that's a 93 and 5 eighths inch belt. So if you have this set up and you put in the supercharger, you're gonna need to buy a longer belt and it might be more of a trial and error. You can run a string through it but what I used was 93 and 5 eighths inches. Now I've got a quick job for you guys while I take a sip out of this cheap and generic looking Jeep mug that I totally bought in the Toledo assembly plant, which makes it really super cool. Anyway, the job for you guys is two things. One, take this opportunity to subscribe to this channel because this is part one of a long series and there's a lot of information that I hope you will enjoy. Part two, share this video with someone who would find it interesting or someone who wouldn't find it interesting or someone who would just watch it because that helps me out exponentially. Part three, and I should have said this a long time ago, a, another channel that does Jeep videos that I respect highly is Days of Pain and Victory. I'm going to have a link to them somewhere. They're nearing dangerously close to a thousand subscribers and that's a huge milestone for us as YouTubers. So go and give him a subscribe as well. Now, you can do that while I sip from this. Thanks for the help, guys. It means a lot. Now that you have picked the correct belt routing for your supercharger, you're going to want to actually mount the supercharger. If you're wondering how to acquire the supercharger, I may have mentioned this before, I got mine off of eBay. You can find them, you just gotta look up SLK 230 Eaton M62 supercharger. Get the one that's got the intake and output ports. You can also go to a junkyard and find one of the Mercedes vehicles I mentioned, which is the C230 1998 through 2000, the SLK 230 98 through 2000. Both of those would have the supercharger that I'm using for these videos. I do want to note that they later switched to an Eaton M45, I think, which is a smaller supercharger and they got rid of the clutch. Now in doing so, they also integrated the bypass valve into the body of the supercharger, meaning that if it fits, and I don't know if it fits, it would lower the cost of this project significantly. I believe you could do it for under 800 rather than under a thousand. So this is my challenge to one of you that is really ambitious. Follow some of these videos, but do so with an Eaton M45. And let me know how it goes. The belt to pulley ratio will come out to be about the same as if you had installed this one, which we'll talk about more later on what that is and what that means. So let's talk about getting this supercharger onto your engine. So assuming that your air conditioning compressor is gone or it was never there, you've got tons of space 
for the supercharger. All you are going to need to mount this supercharger is a flat piece of aluminum. Now, this piece right here, I bought off Amazon. Clearly, you can buy chunks of aluminum on other places or locally if you have shops near you that sell chunks of aluminum. This piece will work, but I would recommend one a little bit larger. This one is eight inches by 12 inches. Now, the eight inches is this width here, and the supercharger and its bolt holes are like almost exactly to that eight inches. So if you can get one bigger, you're gonna do a little bit better, have more room for the screw holes. This one is also half an inch thick. That's plenty. Uh, half inch thick is gonna be plenty strong for you. You can go a little bit thinner, but this is the part of the project where I did a really poor job and I'm not afraid to admit that. I'm not an amazing fabricator. And so if you can do better, then I'm going to encourage you to do so. So I'm gonna be a little bit vague on exactly how to do this project so that way you can do better than I did. But I started with a flat piece of aluminum and this image here is to illustrate that the holes are not predictably square in any way on the supercharger. So what I would recommend is there's a bump on the bottom of the supercharger here. You will mark out with a marker on the aluminum, cut the aluminum around that bump, and then set the supercharger on top drop some long bolts in and draw around them. Now, instead of taking a bunch of measurements around a piece that is in no way square, you have a template of where to drill your holes. Now, I think it's important to note that I did this entire project with simple tools. That was the other thing that I forgot to mention in the previous video is not only are the parts and pieces going to be inexpensive, but the methods need to be inexpensive as well. So I used a jigsaw with a metal cutting blade. I think I bought the jigsaw for $12 and the blade pack was like eight. Incredibly cheap. The next thing you're gonna need is a power drill. You can use corded, cordless, whatever your budget can afford you. A couple drill bits and some taps. Now these are M8 bolts, meaning they're a metric bolt, eight millimeters in diameter. You can find a tap for that pretty easily. I tapped the plate and I drove bolts straight into the plate from the supercharger. My recommendation is if you can figure out a way to make those holes slotted for aft, that's going to be better for you. Because then what I did is I drilled holes for the air conditioning mount and I made those slotted. The other thing you're going to need are little standoffs like this. I believe they should be about an inch and a half, but again, your discretion, go ahead and measure it and see what feels comfortable to you. The reason why you need a standoff like this is because the feet that the supercharger is gonna be sitting on or the screw holes or whatever you wanna call them are elevated and there's material below them. So in order to get the supercharger to stand off of the plate, you'll need something like this. I had a very difficult time finding something I could buy. So this is made from a thicker piece of aluminum that was drilled out on a drill press and then cut, you can cut it with a hacksaw, you can cut it with a jigsaw, or you know, however you wanna cut through it, get through that there. There's spark plugs and other accessories along the side of the engine that you're gonna to wanna to avoid. And so to do that, just kind of mark out on your plate where they are and cut around them. I did trial and error a couple times until I got it to where it fit in there. Now, like I said, this is very vague and I apologize that I'm not giving you a drawing in the future. If I can create one, if I can do it better, I'll give you one. But what I will do is I will give you some design criteria. The first one being the side to side movement. So there's your valve cover, here's the supercharger and there's that pesky radiator hose that we talked about. You're gonna be running into your radiator hose. Now, if you can get the supercharger to move out to the side, left or right, away from the valve cover, you're gonna eliminate hitting that radiator hose or you're gonna reduce it significantly. Doing so, all it's going to really affect is the length of your belt. You might have to buy a longer belt if you move it out. The other thing it could affect is as you become more and more in line with the alternator, you could be reducing the contact patch on the alternator so you don't wanna go over too far. Granted, you're going to be limited by the output of the supercharger. This is gonna get really, really close to your fender well as you move further away from the engine. So it's probably going to find its place naturally based on you not hitting things. A dimension that's incredibly important is fore-aft. 
going forward or backward because you want your pulley to line up perfectly with the other pulleys on the front of the engine. That's why I said you're going to want to slot some of the holes. When you're all said and done, you're probably going to end up with a plate that looks something like this. On the side here, you'll have your cutout for the different accessories and things on the side of the engine. In the back here, you'll have a cutout for that bulge that comes down. This is part of the supercharger, a little bulge right here. And actually, you probably don't need the rest of this. Unless there's a hole mounting up here, I'm trying to remember. Then you'll have your supercharger mount holes. Let's say one's up there, here, and here. And then you will have your mount holes for the air conditioning compressor right there. If, like I said, you can slot these holes for the supercharger and push it forward and backward and then lock it in place, that would be ideal. It's going to be a little bit harder to machine that way because of what's below. But what I had to do is I slotted these holes here and then depending on the offset height of your block, you might be able to get a wrench under the supercharger and you can tighten or loosen those bolts and move it forward and backwards. Keep in mind too that in doing so, you're going to want to pay attention to how it's rotated. You don't want the supercharger being rotated and high on one side, low on the other, and causing the belt to sit at a weird angle. That's no good. As you go through that, do whatever you can to line it up. Throw a ruler on there, do it line of sight, but make sure that your belt is nice and straight going to the other components. Okay, you guys, thank you for tuning in. Hopefully that gives you enough to work on while you're waiting for the next video. The next video is going to be about mounting the intercooler. Intercoolers are pretty important when it comes to forced induction, and we put one on just for good measure, plus they look super cool. So tune in for that. Like, share, subscribe, grab the first video, send it to your friend, whatever you got to do. I'm just glad you're here, and I'll see you next time.